Welcome everyone to this year's launch of China's Most Generous Report as part of Harvard Kennedy School's China Philanthropy Project. I'm Wen Chi Yu, a fellow at Kennedy School's Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation. And I have been a fan of this annual report since its launch in 2016. Today, we're eager Welcome everyone to this year's to launch of the China's most generous findings as part of Harvard Kennedy School's China Philanthropy The Project. authors and when she Edward Cunningham and Yunxin Li. If you haven't, I encourage you to go to our website for the report. It is an interactive research platform and has very cool visuals. So why should we care about China's philanthropy? What are the trends of giving? How is corporate, individual, or foundation giving different? How is the giving in China different from the US? What's the role of the government? So many questions that we hope to answer from today's discussion. Now we only have one hour, so no further ado, I'm turning to Edward Cunningham, who's the China Program Director of the Ash Center to walk you through the beef of this year's report. Then we'll open up for questions and answers. In the meantime, we encourage you to submit questions in the YouTube comment section below. Edward, the screen is yours. Thanks a lot, Wenqi. So first of all, uh, thank you everyone for taking the time to join us. Uh, what really this is, is an opportunity to share some of the, the top line uh, results uh, of an ongoing research project that we've been conducting, uh, as Wenji said, for the past four years. Really it's part of a larger uh, China philanthropy research project, uh, which is generously supported by the Dahlia Foundation. And that project in itself is part of a range of activities under our Ash Center China programs, um, which are all focused on governance and public policy. So the plan today really is also to start uh, by highlighting some headline philanthropy in China that you may see in the media, uh, for those of you who focus on this sector. Um, we're doing that to represent different typologies, different models, a range of models that exist, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, as we, as we uh, you'll see in a second. But also uh, then what we wanna do is to bring you down into uh, the second level, which is from the individual level of these stories into the national level. And the, uh, through a more interactive uh, data uh, website. And the, the issue there and the goal is to share really a deeper dive um, on how those specific stories fit into a broader national picture. So this slide is just uh, gives you an overview uh, of all the work that we do. We, we have uh, training of uh, philanthropists and people, executives in uh, philanthropic organizations. We do a lot of qualitative research, but today we're really focusing on the quantitative side. Um, in terms of that roadmap that I just mentioned, uh, we're really gonna go through and I'll quickly run through some individual stories, then that national level, bring it out to a, a national picture through the website, then go up even larger to the international level to focus on um, how we think about Chinese giving um, in a comparative sense with the United States, the sort of so what, and then end with some early trends uh, and we'll turn to a Q&A. One thing to note, uh, it, all the data you're gonna see we'll discuss uh, today is the most recently available uh, data, which is 2018. There's always a significant lag in, the, in these audited reports uh, and annual reports. Um, and so that's why you'll see um, uh, 2018 uh, in terms of the data. So to jump right into it, here's sort of the pyramid. I think in, from our perspective, from the team's perspective, we're most pleased with how much data we've been able to collect over these years. Um, and more importantly, verify through audited um, recipient documents, meaning the, the foundations, for example, the hospitals, the schools that receive donations uh, in, the, in the majority of cases. Um, and then also when, when not having that through multiple media sources in a few of the cases. We began really with a manual team and also a big data uh, team with Chinese uh, natu natural language processing. It was interesting, I think there, just to take away the big data approach yielded uh, over 3 million articles, which sounded very exciting uh, in, at the beginning, but we ended up having to throw most of them out uh, 
because they were not very accurate. Um, and we ended up really going with the manual team um, over these years um, where the data really ended up being much more credible. So each year annually, we collect tens of thousands of media articles, foundation annual reports, university annual reports, corporate audited reports. Um, and we ended up with uh, about 20,000 um, media articles uh, that were, that were uh, credible um, and reports from over 10,000 different recipient organizations. And then we filtered that up to uh, 15,000 donations, about 75% uh, of, of national giving uh, in China, um, about eight and a half billion dollars. And then uh, filtered that again, and really what we'll focus on today, which is to look at, okay, among that group, let's look at the top givers at the at elite giving um, in order to get a sense of top down what the motivations, the vehicles uh, and, the, and the cause areas are. So that then is the, the, the top uh, donors, the top donations that you see there, which is about 40% of national giving. Um, and then when we compare them to the United States, we're gonna go even higher and look at the top 50 in that uh, US-China comparative. I'll, in the end, um, we'll have my colleague Yun Xin talk more about methodology uh, for, and also uh, if people have questions, certainly they can raise questions. That I'll just say simply that we were very focused on uh, comparing apples to apples, meaning really the individuals, the corporations and the multinational corporations with branches inside China, all operating under the same tax regime and then doing the same in the United States so that we're not getting confused in terms of uh, what tax rules are affecting behavior. And then from that, we then did uh, ended up creating a, a variety of different lists, um, which I'll go into uh, later in terms of the website. But we were very focused on looking at the top 100 um, in China and particularly top 100 individuals, top 100 corporations or other large organizations like labor unions, for example, a generosity index that looked at giving from the individual um, as a percentage of their totally uh, the publicly disclosed total net worth um, and other uh, other lists as well. So behind each data point, of course, is is a life, all right? is, is a person. Um, for all of you who are uh, Mulan fans, that's uh, going that's been uh, pushed back. The release is in July. Um, one of our favorite examples from, uh, from the most recent uh, data is uh, a story of generosity from a woman who I uh, actually view sort of as being straight out of uh, New England's uh, set of priorities here in the Northeast, uh, frugality, innovation, self-reliance, uh, and, and altruism. Um, as you see here, she was China's first, uh, she is China's first female paratrooper. Uh, and she donated close to uh, 2 million US dollars, uh, 10 million RMB in her hometown of Mulan County uh, up in the Northeast uh, to build a cultural and sports center. Um, and there's a lot written about her. For those of you interested, you could look online. Um, and she continues to live a quite of a frugal life, um, but she also uh, had a patent in 1989 related to uh, an ankle brace and landing equipment for paratroopers. Um, and so through that and, and saving uh, effectively, uh, she uh, gave um, that uh, the donation in 2018, which was the cumulative, uh, her cumulative life savings. And just as an aside, she set national records for the oldest enlisted woman to parachute jump and also the most jumps for a female paratrooper. So, of course, you know, the joy of a lot of this work is, is in those stories themselves. So you have sort of the good. Um, she was part of that 100 club, which is really giving 100% of your, of your uh, net worth away. There are also other very uh, heartwarming uh, data points where you see uh, consistently for 20 plus years, people who give the same amount and they do it anonymously. Um, here's an anonymous donor to the Chinese charity who won the Chinese charity award um, given by the Ministry of Civil Affairs and has been doing this every winter since 1999 to the Ningbo uh, Charity uh, Foundation Federation. And uh, significant, I mean, over well, nearly 3 million US dollars uh, this, for this anonymous donor. Then we turn to, to the, the bad, right? From the good to the bad. The, there, it, what we are increasingly uh, focusing on in terms of cutting the data and analyzing the data is these typologies. So different, how do we understand giving um, as a lens into the political economy of China? 
And that's where we see many examples of effectively mandated giving. You could be charitable, uh, no pun intended, of course, and say encouraged, um, but it, they're, all, they're coerced. I mean, there, there's a lot of mandated giving that occurs top down. So giving to your place of work, uh, giving to your place of study. Here's an example of uh, parents who started to push back and go public where every student was required to donate uh, about a thousand RMB $150 or so um, because to the school itself, uh, given their uh, ongoing financial difficulty, um, which was um, caused quite a row uh, in terms of the media. Um, and the school was actually calling out and naming families that were not uh, giving as part of what was termed a voluntary drive. Uh, you, other examples in this uh, Hubei a hospital, this is back in 2018, so it's not, not COVID related, even though people often will link that to, to the, these days, where a nurse really went public and started publishing these mandatory donation requirements, which, is, which are prohibited uh, according to the uh, Chinese charity law. Um, and these were donations that were deducted directly from employee salaries. Um, so these were all deleted pretty quickly, but we were able to capture some of that as well. So you have that top-down um, mandated giving. Of course, you also have a, quite a bit of bribery uh, and corruption where uh, giving is a form of effectively a laundering. Uh, so this was um, a uh, Lee Sherman, who was a, a minister in the Civil Affairs uh, Bureau, um, and he, uh, uh, he uh, a senior, rather uh, senior official uh, in, that, in that bureau in Hainan, and he uh, was had, had basically uh, pocketed about a million RMB and then gave 60% uh, of it towards social welfare programs uh, in a way to, uh, to try to effectively launder it. Um, so you have that. And then you have the more interesting and, and complicated uh, cases where you have uh, people who give uh, and then create quite a stir because there are questions about their own um, relationship, uh, obviously, to the country, um, particularly in this case, to, to cultural uh, treasures and to art. And in this particular case, it was the, the contrast um, between uh, a, a collector from, a, from a, a significant family with significant history in China, who uh, many of ancestors of who um, taught uh, uh, the emperor, in fact, um, and where in the one case, he had donated to our Boston Museum of Fine Arts, in fact, uh, and it was, a, it was a donation in 2018, but um, 18 years earlier, he had effectively sold uh, um, these uh, books to the Shanghai Library uh, for about $5 million, four and a half million dollars. And it was that, it was that contrast where giving to a foreign organization, but selling to a domestic organization um, where he become, came under significant uh, scrutiny um, and criticism about being un, unpatriotic in his giving. <clears throat> so that just gives you a very top line um, headlines on certain uh, data points and stories. So what I'm gonna do now is try to put that into more of a national uh, context by doing a deeper dive into our uh, quite interactive uh, website. So that the, 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 the website itself um, has an annual report uh, that uh, you, for those of you who are interested can, can click and go into. Uh, that has an executive summary and, and then lots of charts um, and uh, analysis. Um, but what this website really does uh, is it allows you to have a dashboard effectively. Um, and the, the dashboard is on the left, as you can see, gives some top line numbers um, and you can see quite clearly where uh, corporations, uh, organizations, largely corporations, are the vast majority of elite giving of, of that four and a half billion, about four of it, in fact, uh, comes from uh, corporations and other large organizations in China. Um, this, uh, just these top 100 individuals and top 100 organizations is, again, about 40% of total giving, so it's fairly concentrated. And then what you can do is then look uh, at different lists that we've created, individuals, organizations, and then this generosity index where you, we've reorganized uh, based on people's um, individuals giving uh, and their wealth. And then according to each of these organizations, uh, these uh, categorizations, uh, you can then go and look at the specific individual. So let me just, as an example, um, 
people may know Lu Weiding. He uh, is the is the president of One Xiang Group, which has a significant presence in the United States. In fact, uh, it was founded by his father. Um, they're in. They began automotive uh, components and now are highly diversified. Um, and you can see, as an example, like many donors, uh, he really is only giving to one particular cause. This is unspecified because. Um, it was multiple uh, causes that were not spe specific in terms of their amount. So for those cases, we put them in unspecified. And really to, uh, to Zhejiang uh, itself, given the headquarters of Wanxiang Group um, as one example. Uh, or you can look at, uh, in rather than individuals, you know, you can do a deeper dive and look at to an organization. So here's Evergrande Group, which is uh, a major real estate conglomerate, always past several years at the top of our list. Um, and you can see where they, where they give. Um, you can actually remove, uh, if you're interested in going deeper and looking just at social welfare, for example, um, you can get rid of these other, um, these, these other uh, causes and you can add them. So social welfare is so small, in fact, you can barely see it. Look at the geography of giving. So it allows you to do a deep dive into the, um, into the, uh, the different donors. The, here are the lists uh, that we have, top 10. You can then view the full list. Uh, here's Evergrande again at the top. Um, this is a, a, really a thumbnail. You can then go deeper. Uh, interesting, China Three Gorges, a major state enterprise. Um, look at their focus causes, and then do a deeper dive. If you're interested in thinking about um, generosity uh, as a uh, giving as a percentage um, of total uh, publicly disclosed net worth, <clears throat> you can then go to this uh, list, and then we have a much larger list as well, where you can look at one of our alums, in fact, uh, Dang Yanbao, who's from Ningxia province. Uh, he is an energy entrepreneur, was one of our students, in fact, <clears throat> in the uh, in our uh, executive training programs, and again giving um, to giving quite locally to Ningxia itself. You can see here he gives to education and poverty alleviation, but without the amounts, we put that into unspecified in terms of his uh, particular in his particular case, or someone like Lucy Pung, who is uh, quite high profile as a founder of um, uh, Alibaba, one of the founders of Alibaba. Uh, here again, um, as you can see, really dominated by um, unspecified given the fact that you cannot always um, uh, within these reports the, 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 the amounts for each cause are not always uh, specified so we're always very clear to make sure we're, we're not overstating but again giving mostly in Zhejiang given um, that that uh, the, the Alibaba's uh, headquarter she's actually number one in our generosity list uh, this year so having a woman is is great um, and then uh, as you move farther down the, the website, you then can see that there are highlights. And, and here, what we're doing is trying to make it quite easy to get in and out um, of, of the website and, and be able to also um, share some of the, 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 the takeaways. Um, what I'll also do is show you the, some of the data. So. If you want to look and cut the data a different way, you, you, find, you may find that you're interested in, for example, the generosity itself, right? This generosity index. So looking at who is the, the most generous in terms of total giving, here is 600 million, but maybe rather Lucy, who is the most generous in terms of her, her uh, giving as a percentage, right, of her wealth, as you can see here. So we put it on the X and Y axis to allow people to, to do that. You may be interested only uh, in different sectors. So there you can go, and this is color coded by sector. You can either remove people from different sectors if you're only interested in tech, for example, um, or you can just go to the industry uh, um, chart and look at the tech sector uh, itself here and start getting a deeper inside uh, by clicking in here and then looking at various individuals uh, clicking on that there's Tencent as a corporate uh, donor, for example. So that's another way to slice the data. You may be interested in age. Uh, you, we will see in a second how age in China is, we see people giving much younger um, in terms of their, uh, their lifetime. 
and or you might be interested in particular causes. So for me, uh, environment is dear to my heart. Sadly, not as many donations at the elite level, um, but you can then um, do a deeper dive uh, through, through, through these charts. Uh, for those of you who are interested in how, how diverse the giving is, um, you can also look at cause, number of causes. So as you see, one, two, three, up to eight on the, uh, on the y-axis. Here's a very interesting uh, data point where the most diverse giver um, in our data is the China National Tobacco Corporation, a major state-owned enterprise. And here you can see the, the, the variety of causes, mostly poverty alleviation. We'll get to that in a second. Um, and, uh, and unspecified again, because not all the data is, is, is clearly linked to a specific cause, but look at the incredible diversity uh, in terms of geography, because it of course is a national um, a company. Often um, we can get deeper into this in Q and A, but often uh, working with local government because tobacco is grown on land and local government governs a lot of land. Uh, issues and permits. So those are different ways that uh, the, the site can be used. Um, the, the, the list themselves I went through, um, you, can, you can click on different lists if you're more interested in organizations versus uh, more interested in individuals and their total giving versus generosity. This allows you to go much deeper through many, many different uh, names. Um, but what we're also quite excited about um, is geography of giving. So if you are someone who cares about the geography uh, aspect um, of giving, you can then look at origins, destinations, and flows. So this clearly shows you how really origins are largely coastal, rich areas. Interesting enough, don't, destinations are also largely coastal. Uh, that's often because, and we'll get into this later as well, most of the foundations are themselves located in wealthy areas and coastal areas. And then you can look at sort of flight maps effectively um, that uh, between uh, origin and destination and you can choose whichever interests you and then do a deep dive um, that way. Uh, moving forward, what will be interesting and uh, is that we will then be tracking data from foundations then granting out um, and that will be a very different, of course, um, geographic uh, image, um, but those are grants. So that would be old money, not new money in the system. So we started off this project looking at new money in the system, you know, from donors to uh, foundations and other direct uh, gifts. Lastly, we have a, a, a blog. And so for those of you interested in COVID, for example, we have both uh, the uh, recent entry of what Chinese philanthropists are doing abroad to address that issue, but also um, uh, an interesting uh, blog entry around um, the corruption issue and some of the, the real challenges of transparency in organizations like the, uh, the Red Cross Society of China, uh, for example. So that was just a, a, a deep dive uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the website, just to give you a sense of the national context. Uh, now I just wanna move on to some of the, so the so what and the comparative, the international level, uh, the US and China. Here, um, we're just trying to answer some of the, 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 the key questions we, we were all interested in, which is where are they coming from? <clears throat> what, 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 what industries are leading? There each year, what we see is that real estate is always at the fore, um, often because real estate, private real estate corporations uh, very much uh, need the help of local government um, and are often giving to local government charities and local government priorities. Um, and that those of you who live in China know, uh, uh, know about China, understand that the nexus of that power structure there. We can go into more discussion on Q&A. <clears throat> Healthcare number two, uh, a highly regulated uh, industry where the role of government also is quite critical. Um, interestingly, if you flip to the United States, you'll see that um, there are real outliers. And what you basically see each year is uh, a flip, always between finance and tech. That's whether really Warren Buffett on the finance side is giving or uh, it's um, uh, uh, Bill Gates and Melinda Gates or Mark Zuckerberg. Um, and Priscilla Chan, and then I'm moving to tech. So there it's, it's, it's stable between those two sectors and you get a real sense at the elite level of how imbalanced US giving really is and is dominated by just a few, a few families. Um, uh, in terms of what causes they support in, uh, in China and the United States, 
what you see, what, what, what jumps out at you on the Chinese side, of course, is each year um, that we do this, <clears throat> uh, usually education is number one. Um, and maybe in Q&A, we can go through why. Um, but interest in 2018, uh, following a, the work report in, in October 2017 uh, from Xi Jinping around uh, the war on um, uh, poverty and the, this, the, the goal to um, end poverty this year in 2020 in China, uh, we saw a, sh a significant shift uh, in giving at the elite level to poverty alleviation, whereas historically it was number two, number three, um, uh, 2018, it, it jumped to number one, which, which is, is an interesting indicator of how important uh, politically uh, the, these, 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 these guidelines are to, to individuals who are philanthropists. Um, if you look on the, United, uh, on the US side, what I think jumps out at, at me and to many is that three quarters is, of it is unrestricted, meaning fundamentally, most of the giving at the elite level is occurring and is going to foundations. Those foundations themselves are highly diversified and, they're, and those gifts are not tied, they're not restricted. They're simply given to those foundations and, and then uh, sent out grants in a whole variety of different uh, cause areas. Which, we, which is very different than in China, where even if they're given to foundations, those foundations are, are highly, as we saw in terms of number of causes, are actually quite focused uh, and are not diversified. Um, interesting enough on the US side, for elite um, giving, uh, education is always very high, as you see here. Um, if you actually went to total national giving in the United States and really looked at the full picture, uh, not just the, the, the major givers, but, but the everyday giver, uh, it's religion. And that gets to an interesting point on the Chinese data where what I call the dog that does not bark uh, is quite important, where we have very few, we have a, a couple, but very few data points on religious giving, despite the fact that as we, as we know, um, in fact, may in very well be the number one cause of giving in China, um, but none of it uh, is, is uh, recorded or very few of those gifts are recorded um, sort of for obvious reasons, given the, 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 the political sensitivity there, that's maybe something else we can talk about. Uh, who is, in terms of who's receiving the donations, uh, here's a, a comparison that tells you quite a bit, I think. In some ways, China and the United States are not that different in the sense that and increasingly in China, private foundations matter. And this uh, shows that. So about a third of, of the giving is happening uh, and is, is, is being given to non-governmental charitable foundations in China. Um, you know, but on, in contrast, about 40% uh, is, is being given to directly to government or to government charitable foundations, often at the provincial level, uh, as well as at the, the national level. The other difference you'll see, of course, is that NGOs uh, do play a role in the United States. Uh, in China, it's much, much minimal in terms of their support by, from elite Chinese donors. How do they give? In, in China, the, most of the, the, the donations are through corporations. Um, that's something that is very, uh, that is a stable um, aspect of giving in China, whereas the vast majority in, in the US is through individuals. It makes sense in the sense that from the US perspective, uh, companies are not uh, rarely pay taxes, so they're not that motivated to give at, at, in terms of large group, large gifts. Um, whereas in China, um, while the, the, tax, the, the tax situation has become more a specific, has, has clarified, uh, particularly with the charity law and amendments to that law, um, the reality is, even though an individual can, can deduct 30% of their, their income uh, annually and a corporation can deduct 12% of their um, gross, uh, of their profit annually, the reality is that when you interview and actually look into why people give through the corporations in China, largely relates to control, combination of control um, through the corporation of the giving and the fact that they inure uh, to, to nourish to the benefit of the corporation and the brand of the corporation um, when they give through the corporation. Uh, third is that many of many individuals, even quite wealthy individuals, haven't set up uh, their own private or corporate foundations. So uh, for them, the, the, the vehicle that makes the most sense is corporations. That's changing over time, which, which we'll, we'll get to. And then the last a couple of points uh, in terms of the, the so what, um, we, we, if you look at really the, the wealth indices that we tend to see, 
in a lot of other lists like Hurun and others, what we're trying to do here is move from that frame from pure wealth to generosity because it tells a lot. You know, you, you, the US gets a lot of credit for having generous individuals. And yes, those percentages are higher on the left. <clears throat> in fact, the, on the right, the Chinese numbers are probably overestimated, right? Because we don't really truly know all of their net worth for, for private, for individuals who uh, have, um, we can only use individuals who have publicly listed companies to be able to even attempt to this. And I'm sure obviously many of, much of their wealth is also not publicly disclosed. So that denominator is bigger and therefore that number will be, uh, is, is probably overestimated here. Um, so on the one hand, yes, does China look less generous? It does compared to the United States. In fact, you see on these global lists of countries, China ends up being you know, number 180. Um, we think that that in many ways though, really underestimates how much giving and how much generosity is occurring in China, not just because of the religious um, data that we don't, there was no access to and doesn't exist fundamentally. So there's the dog that not barking issue, but also because we have to always remember the United States comparatively to other countries, particularly EU, for example, easy compar comparative point, uh, we pay low taxes. Despite what our people's complaints, we're much lower taxes. Uh, we started well over 50, 60, even 70% in the 1950s, 1960s. And then by the 70s, massive reductions in, in taxes, meaning that um, in a place like uh, the UK or France or Italy, uh, those higher taxes, of course, are generosity. It's just intermediated through the state and through uh, state services, uh, whereas in the US, we don't have that. And so we tend to give uh, directly, uh, given our lower tax rate. Um, in terms of age, uh, th this is less surprising in, in the sense that uh, Chinese um, billionaires and wealth is newer. And so it's very clear, no matter how you slice it, the average US philanthropist is 16 years older than the average Chinese philanthropist at the elite level. Again, looking at the top 50 right now, um, or even in terms of amount, clearly in the United States, about half of that elite giving is in, in people in their 90s, whereas over half are in their 40s in China. Uh, that's related to demographics to some extent, but it's also related to another important issue around the instruments that are available in the United States for giving, trusts, um, charitable remainder trusts, uh, foundations, uh, and I'll, I'll get to that at, at the very end. So what do, we, what do we see then, right, when you step back? Well, there are really five early trends. Uh, one is we are seeing clearly the rise of foundations, um, but those foundations are really vehicles that are affiliated with the donor or their corporation if they're not giving directly through their corporation. So there's evidence of that professionalization and standardization that tools are rising. <clears throat> Moving forward, we're gonna start tracking, uh, this year in fact, we're already tracking ch these charitable trusts, but it also suggests a continued real dis distrust in a lot of these institutions um, that are truly separate from the donor, right? Whether they're separate geographically from their headquarters of their company or separated through their management. So that is not, we're not yet seeing examples of that. Um, so a lot of the giving is, is, is quite direct through the corporation or um, through their own managed uh, foundation. But we're also, we think we're gonna see, and we're already starting to see the rise of tech where a shift in the economy of China away from real estate towards technology We'll, uh, we're starting to see that uh, filter through the data in terms of tech uh, giving. Um, we also see the durability of education uh, where yes, there's some volatility. So again, given that uh, work report and the focus on poverty alleviation, uh, we saw that come to the fore in 2018. For most years, education remains at the top, um, largely through the personal impact education had on the donors. Um, but uh, every so often you'll see infrequent uh, natural disasters and then you'll see natural disasters and, and that disaster relief come to the fore. Uh, but those are the minority of cases given the, the infrequency. And sadly, environmental concerns continue to rate quite low. Um, that's often driven by really three factors. One, environment, the environment is viewed as the role of government, the responsibility of government. Um, it's, a, it's a public good. Second, um, there's a collective action problem where most of the donors you, you interview feel they don't have an impact, uh, can't have an impact. Um, and, uh, and third, uh, the environment is often uh, viewed as an area in which 
we, we think we will see some increase, um, but for, for most donors, it's an area where um, there is, from their perspective, a lot of foreign interest and foreign NGO help. Um, again, there's exceptions, and for people interested, we can, we can talk about that. And then the last couple of points is rising age, where we think we're going to see over time as donors begin to um, age uh, out, uh, and also as they become more comfortable with Ping An and other organizations that have trust, charitable reindeer trusts and other types of trusts, um, they are and will continue to start adopting those um, uh, tools, which then allow them to give much later in their life and even, of course, at the end of their life. And, and I think we're thinking that's going to eventually push up uh, the average age. Um, and the, the last uh, point in terms of trends is what we're seeing um, is there are there is stability in terms of these players. Uh, there's evidence of a real sustained commitment, uh, even at very significant hundreds of millions of dollar levels of giving. And that's a metric that we will continue to track uh, really as a potential proxy uh, for the deepening and the sort of professionalization of the sector um, and to see how stable that really that group fundamentally is. Um, so I'll just leave uh, while we do q and I'll just leave this uh, these some of these takeaway points uh, up on the up on the screen. Thank you so much, Edward. Um, lots of lots of content, and and I feel like every year the report is even better and better. So um, appreciate it. Um, a few uh, immediate questions, and I know we have many people watching online and have questions, and we'll come to you in a second. Um, but first of all, I thought it's especially interesting to compare the U.S. and China models. Um, you know, there are more individuals uh, who give in the U.S. Uh, compared to China, which is more organizational based. You kind of touched on it, which um, has something to do with the tax system. Um, and what do you think about, for example, the maturity of businesses, uh, given, you know, China really didn't start to have the private sector, private market until, you know, just three decades ago. Um, and is this going to change? Uh, with their market economy or socialist market economy getting more mature. Um, the other question I, I, I really want to ask you is, um, you know, state-owned state enterprises, um, which is kind of a, a strange animal in, in the Western perspective. And you counted their giving as corporate giving. Um, mm -hmm. You know, wouldn't you consider that as government giving? Mm -hmm. so just the yep. two questions to start. Good, 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 great questions. Maybe uh, as usual, I'll, I'll start with the, the, the second. Um, yes, so so we've gotten that a question a lot, and, and you can imagine we we have um, a lot of debate in the, on the on the team as we every year as we go through this. Um, so in one sense, of course, yes. Uh, when you look at something like uh, Three Gorges, uh, that is a uh, one of the the largest energy conglomerates in China and um, owned by uh, the state. Asset Supervision Administration uh, Commission, SASAC. So <clears throat> if you look at the ownership structure, it is true that, that there's a significant uh, government ownership there. Um, when it comes to decisions of actual giving, however, what, what is interesting is, of course, like with even a private corporation, government priorities and policies and, and even leaders matter. Um, we saw that even in terms of a lot of the mandated giving that I started with. On the other hand, we, we thought it's important to make the distinction between corporation um, and government because in the end of the day, the corporation does have a choice specifically through its board um, and through the chairman of, of what percentage they want to give right, of their profits away. Um, that it's not as if the central government um, is that involved in the in the details of how um, those assets are moved. <clears throat> so on the one hand, it's important. It's, that's a, a true distinction uh, between a a, uh, a a on the books decision of a, of a government to 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 give um, versus a corporation. On the one, that's one reason. The other is there's a, a deeper question there, which we've discussed, which is when a government is is um, is, is granting monies, uh, funds, is that really a donation 
or is that simply government support, right, to a particular um, area that that has need, right? And and um, that that's a that's a that's a much more important distinction where we wanted to make the distinction between a, a donation um, versus a direct uh, government transfer of funds. Um, so that's how I would answer that that, that makes, question. That makes perfect um, sense. Yeah, the, the the first question. Um, so what do we expect to see over time with in terms of corporations versus individuals? Uh, I think the quick answer is that we we do expect that as these tools become available and as trust does grow in the the legal and financial uh, wealth management tools through institutions and banks that are clearly growing to meet private wealth needs within China. <clears throat> often because of concern that foreign that a lot of that um, that capital can be offshored and then given to foreign wealth management or, uh, companies, for example, and banks. Um, because of that, we do think we will see an in, in, increase in terms of individual uh, giving. Yeah. Um, on the one hand, and in terms of corporations, we think also we will see however, continued um, strength, meaning it relatively corporations should go down over time. In some ways they have already in early, uh, you know, in, in terms of these early years of, of what we've been doing. Um, on the other hand, while, it go, while I think they will go down in relative terms, it won't be by much in the near term in terms of the next five years, simply because the distrust in this sector is high, meaning whether it's the Red Cross Society of China or the Provincial uh, Charity Foundation, um, there is significant opacity. And that lack of transparency means that control is, is paramount, particularly a sight line through to where that money is being spent. Um, and I think that's why we're, we're you, when you actually get down to the details, why corporations remain um, a, an important vehicle. Thank you. Um, I. Um, you know, when I was living in China, one of the most exciting developments in society is really about giving, um, whether it's citizen giving or um, just, you know, ultra high net worth individuals giving. And that's why you see this increase of private banking uh, business in, in China as well. So hopefully we'll, we'll be able to see more individual giving um, yeah. down the road. Now, Yunxin, um, you've been working on this report for a couple of years. So thank you for collecting and reviewing such large amount of uh, data and information, both quantitatively and, and qualitatively, um, and turn it into a really nice looking report. Um, can you tell us a bit more about your methodology? Um, you know, what are the key data points? And, and most importantly, I think, how do you validate the information? Because we always, you know, wonder where the data comes from. Can we trust China's data? Um, what are some of the key challenges when, you know, collecting information? Okay. Um, actually, the goal of our project is to create China's first systematic and rigorous giving database. So in our data collection, we include only actual amount it donated, and we exclude all the unfulfilled pledges. And as Edward just said, we are focusing on the elite donation. So we only collect donations that are larger than 100,000 RMB. And well, our database includes stock donations and in-kind donations. Our current published most generous ranking only include cash donations. And to avoid the risk of double counting, we also exclude donations from the China's governmental foundations, as well as other charitable foundations that can receive public donations. And for each data points or each observation in our database, uh, it represents an actual donation happened in that year. So in our 2018 data, there are about uh, 15,000 valid donations in total. And before the data cleaning process, there were about uh, 16,000 potential data points. And later we kick about 10% of them because they didn't suffice our data validation criteria. Mm -hmm. To be considered valid by our team, a donation must at least meet one of our two data validation criteria. The first one is that donation must appear on the recipient's all the reports, any reports submitted to the government 
I mean the Ministry of Civil Affairs mm. or the recipient's website. And for the donations to the recipients who do not have a website or reports like the individuals, uh, then the donation must appear on the three separate reports by third parties, such as the media. Mm -hmm. And reports or articles by the donor organization or by two or fewer media sources alone do not qualify our Ooh. validation. Mm -hmm. So in a word, we are kind of like recipient oriented and we don't trust the information from the donor, especially for the pledges. You know, every year during the data collection and the analysis, we met like one or two big challenges. One challenge we are still facing now is about the valuation for the in-kind gifts. You know, for example, um, the donations in goods and services in the healthcare industry can have an outsized impact on, on our giving. That's largely because the valuation of the donating medicine by pharmaceutical companies can vary so largely. And no matter what valuation method we use, I mean, by retail price or by even by wholesale prices, they still run into billions of RMB and yield significant donation size. But we think it is unfair to compare two donors when one of the donors donated 100 million in cash and the other one who donated 100 million of his or her company's products. So that's the problem. And our current so solution is for all the non-cash donations, we just decide the value from the recipient's party. I mean, we are just using the number that's shown on their other reports. And we don't do the uh, pressing part ourselves. And also we exclude the, like the, all the non-cash donations for our carrying all the rankings and analysis in the reports and the websites. But we realize this is still not an ideal solution. Mm -hmm. And we welcome like comments and suggestions on the analysis and the carrying methodology. Um, if you have any like good suggestions, you can reach out to us through the email that are listed on our website and we look forward to discussions and advice on helping us improve the current work. Thank you. Um, I think people have some, uh, you know, some kind of um, perception of, you know, what China's data um, is like. Um, I have to say over the past few years, um, there's increasing transparency and you definitely see government as well as civil society and with a lot of assistance from international uh, players to help make uh, the charitable data um, more uh, comprehensive and more um, transparent. And, and so this is all, you know, very encouraging developments. Now we have um, a few really interesting questions, um, you know, from our audience. Um, I'm going to pick a few. Um, one of the my questions too that shows up on the screen is, what are the trends in international philanthropy from China to other countries? Uh, does philanthropy play a role in China's global soft power uh, on an in individual or institutional basis? Great, good question. And we, we, we get that a lot actually. So interestingly enough, um, and the blog has a little bit, the most recent blog entry, I encourage people to read um, by uh, a, one, of the, uh, one of the Schwartzman actually, a, a, a Oxford graduate who is, is gonna enter Schwartzman uh, at Tsinghua in fact, um, college. He, uh, that goes in a bit uh, into detail on this question. So in a sense, you'd think yes, right? That, that giving abroad would, get, would, would uh, end up with um, creating significant soft power for China. <clears throat> the reality is when you actually look at the data, very few donations are international uh, in terms of Chinese giving. Um, they, they tend to be um, quite focused on the United States, particularly luckily for us, uh, U.S. Uh, 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 universities, um, so they're fairly narrow. Uh, they're they're, those are fairly large, but they're few in number. And so, uh, the I think the potential is certainly there. Um, we're in terms of cash donations uh, for increasing Chinese soft power. We we don't really see it yet. Um, now that's quite different when you then turn towards COVID and and in kind donations. Um, for, uh, for personal protective equipment, for example, PPE, where we are seeing uh, a significant uptick 
in those types, that type of philanthropy, which is what the blog covers. Um, I think there, yes, there, it, it, is, in, it is an important uh, way for Chinese society to show that there's a distinction between society and government and also is an important way to, to reinforce uh, a different narrative, of course, uh, particularly related to something like COVID, which of course emerged in China um, and has caused significant uh, blowback uh, to not just Chinese, but you know, uh, Americans, uh, uh, American, uh, Asian Americans, um, and, and anyone of, of Asian ethnicity uh, in, the, in, the US, in the US and in Europe. Um, so it is important, uh, not just from a soft power perspective, but from a narrative perspective, I think. Yeah, um, I also notice Chinese individual giving, as you said, a lot of them give to the US. Um, I, I remember when, uh, when I was working for a bank, um, you know, Part of our service is to provide, I would say, wealth management advice to those ultra high net worth individuals. And a lot of them, obviously, you know, when their company uh, go public, that's when they all of a sudden become billionaires or at least, you know, multiple millionaires. And so that's a lot of wealth overnight and they have to manage their wealth. Um, and, and a lot of them choose to go public in, in the US market. And so US dollars become um, you know, where their cash is. And so giving is part of almost a necessity. Um, obviously it's very strategic as well, you know, if you, if you consider personal uh, reputation and business brand. Um, so that's, you know, one of the more interesting trends that I, that I noticed yes. um, that were happening. Mm -hmm. um, now, the other question I thought is really, really interesting is uh, environmental causes. I know that's your yep. Edward's, uh, passion. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain why there's so little giving to uh, yes. environmental issues? Yes, great. So this is something we've thought a lot about, and it's very interesting. Um, one caveat that, that's important, and because again, data, we all love data, we all love lists, no matter what our cultural uh, background is, um, but data can, can uh, reveal, but also can hide, uh, depending on assumptions. So one important caveat is, because we wanted to look at just new money into the system, uh, step one, which, which was a, a, a very uh, labor intensive step, was to look, was to make sure that we're collecting credible data of donations from the donor to an institution, right? Nonprofit institution. That is new money in. What we're now doing this year is then being able to track it more carefully through the entire life cycle of the money, meaning then from the foundation, for example, and it's grants out. So that will probably also change results, right? Meaning not just where money goes and, 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 and is received in terms of um, that actual donation, but then also the grants. So that's the one caveat. Let's, let's, we're very interested to see once we then can take those grant, the grant data, um, mm -hmm. see how it changes some of these, um, some of these uh, results. So having said that, the, I, I do not expect environment to grow that much. It is under 1% of giving for 2018. Um, it was a little over 1% the year before. So why do, why do I expect that to continue and for it to be very low? Number one, globally, it's very low. No matter what country you look at, it's about 3% or under in terms of total giving for any given nation. Um, part of that relates, again, to this question of the environment is, a ver is the defi by definition, a tragedy of the commons and is a public good. Most people, but certainly in China, and there's other interesting surveys by, by other uh, organizations that look at this, where even more so, there's a pronounced um, faith uh, belief in China that it is the government's responsibility to solve that environmental issue. Yeah. So that's the first overriding reason. The second overriding reason is given that, and the role that foreign NGOs have played um, in that uh, particular sector, a lot of people within China, philanthropists believe that their money is not that complementary. Again, not all. There's, there are exceptions, but most that they are that they are not. They cannot supplement that. They shouldn't supplement it. So that's that's something that's being taken care of by either the government or foreign uh, NGOs and foundations. Um, 
And, and third, I think that the, we, 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 in terms of interviews on the qualitative side, the third reason is they often will argue that the environment is the price for economic development, even, and in, in fact, it's often pronounced even more among people who have benefited from globalization, so people who have the wealth, um, they view the environment while important, obviously, and increasingly important in terms of their children. Um, for those who at least remain in China, um, the, there is a, 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 an explicit um, uh, sort of social contract there where it, it's a cost that they're willing to pay uh, for, for economic development. Sounds good. I know we have some time for the last question, probably, um, and this will go to Yunxin or um, Edward, feel free to you know chime in. Um, I know we're looking at the elite donation. Um, will the report look at uh, grassroots uh, donation in the future, um, especially through crowdfunding uh, applications? Yeah. Um, you know what? You know, for those who don't know, actually, uh, grassroots giving is very, very uh, popular in China. Um, any app, major app from WeChat to, you know, Alipay, I mean, you can easily make individual donation from small amount to larger amount. Um, I would say it's even more events compared to the U.S. And that's a big part of um, civil society development. Yes. Um, are we considering doing that in next year's or in the future reports? Sure. So Yunxin, I'll do. I'll take an initial shot at that, and then you you can also obviously follow up. Um, so yes, the answer is yes. So for about two years now, we actually already have been um, pushing that line. So that that twenty, you know, we, and again, it, it's unknown. It, it's probably maybe fifteen percent or seventeen percent of total giving. So it is important, um, yeah. undoubtedly, and it it's a very different. Uh, it, it probably will give us a very different. Um, um, a view. And so we have been focused on how best to get that uh, bottom up uh, data versus the top down approach we've taken. The, the, to do that, um, what's required is, is to basically just to have um, partnerships with Tencent um, and other platforms in order to be able to have um, access to, to that data. And so we've had those discussions, uh, they're ongoing and we are hopeful we will be able to get access. Um, we have, through our training, have had a lot of the executives from their corporate foundations through our programs. They've been incredibly helpful um, in this. And uh, so we, we do hope to be able to have it uh, either this year or next year, <clears throat> because uh, our instinct is that those causes um, even though it's a much smaller amount in aggregate, those causes may in, in fact be highly diverse. Um, the the yes. number one. Number two, what we're excited about potentially is it's an interesting question um, about online giving. In mm -hmm. some ways, it looks highly democratic, right? It looks very fragmented. You would assume it's highly fragmented. But then when you end up talking to people who actually give online, and then you speak to a lot of the smaller organizations that want the online donations, what they end up telling you is it's actually a, a bottleneck problem. So th whether it's WeChat um, as one example or, or other platforms, they will act, they, it's hard to get the real estate on that app, meaning for most people, uh, the majority of that money is funneled to the biggest organizations at the top of that app. It's very hard for the small organizations to actually get um, the, the online donation. So there's a crowding out effect. And so what's kind of interesting is you'd expect very fragmented, quite widespread, but what we think we're going to see is actually there's a real narrowing of um, platforms and narrowing of channels and therefore a narrowing of which organizations actually receive those donations. But that's an hypothesis, but we, we hope to be able to answer it. Um, does Yunxin want to say something about this? Yeah, and uh, actually we had the discussion on the online giving like two years ago, actually. Yep. We already tried to include that part of uh, data into our database. But the problem is we realize that there are so many different yeah. platforms on this like Weibo, Weixin, and so many and some other small, very small apps also have the also have their own vehicles on this. Yeah. Our problem is uh, we are considering that if it is if it 
if we can get enough data, like overall data for the analysis, and if we cannot get everything into our database, if um, if our data is biased by some of the big platform or not. So we also are considering maybe we can do some sampling data for the online uh, online platform analysis. Yes, good point. That's right. So that, that's right. So we were thinking that might be the best solution is to the extent we can get the access um, then doing a, a random sample. Uh, so that because it's 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 looks like it's very difficult to be able to get all data uh, access to all data certainly on all platforms. Mm -hmm. For sure, that'll require um, some collaboration with those um, yeah. platform companies. Right. But I, I do think that's one of the most interesting developments. Um, it also yeah. says a lot about their tech capability and creativity yes. uh, for citizen participation. Now we are over time. Uh, thank you so much for watching this discussion online. Um, in my view, understanding China's philanthropy is a window to China's political, economic, business, and civil society development trends. So thank you, Edward and Yunxing, for sharing with us such important findings as learning about China has never been more important at this uh, historical juncture. So yes. finally, we would like to thank our generous donors who make the annual report and China Philanthropy Project possible, especially the Dalio Foundation. Thank you for watching us. Take care and stay yeah. safe. And we also, I'll just add, we also welcome people with any expertise in the sector. You know, if your interest is in blogging, for example, or other aspects, you know, we, we welcome, uh, just reach out through the website. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.